You're not born sectarian. You learn sectarianism and you learn that from a very early age. Well, it's basically somebody being attacked, whether verbally or otherwise, because of their religion. The real damage of sectarianism is probably in the kind of football-related aggression. Drinking, sectarianism, put it all together and you're just going to have a volcano, basically. It was described, I think, politically as, as Scotland's hidden shame, but the, I think the shameful part is it's not that hidden. It's difficult to answer the question of whether women in sectarianism are victims or perpetrators because I feel that there's been such little research really done to look at how sectarianism brought bigotry, anti-Irish racism, to look at how that has affected women. I'm Najma, and how I got involved with the project was through the Refugee Council. They had sent me like an email telling me about the project and how you guys were looking for females to come and participate. They were looking for filmmakers or people who wanted to learn about filmmaking and yeah, and I was interested in that. I'm Lorreen and I was interested in making this documentary because I wanted to learn how to interview. I was interested in getting into people's heads and finding out why they think the way they do. I'm Gabby and I work in theatre and film production and I first got involved in this project because I had experienced sectarianism through work and relationships. Uh, my understanding of sectarianism prior to the project was just none, I guess. It was just the word sectarianism, I had heard of it and I guess I was able to associate it to football. I knew about it, but I didn't really know the history of it. I think I definitely experienced it through relationships, um, having boyfriends that were Protestant and I'm Catholic and inviting them into my family and then also being invited into their families and just, you know, the different kind of things you experience through that. Sectarianism is a vast subject. So we wanted to explore different aspects of the subject in different areas and this film is a collection of our findings. My name's Gabby and I was interested in looking at why the sectarian divide in Glasgow still exists and also if the celebration of Irish culture contributes to that divide. It was really difficult at the beginning trying to get contributors for the film, mainly just using the word sectarianism, putting that in an email or saying that over the phone to someone because the reaction just immediately changed and we did find there was this kind of don't say the S word because people don't want to be associated with it. I was interested in getting involved with the Catholic Church. I had contacted a number of priests and I think using the sectarianism word got absolutely no response and that wasn't able to be taken any further. I think Ronnie Convery gave quite a helpful interview for us because it was our really only insight into the Catholic Church. It is still a little canter that's still in there and eats away at our society. So it manifests itself in an intolerance of open displays of culture, Catholic culture or Irish culture, and especially Irish Catholic culture. There wouldn't be that same intolerance towards probably Italian culture or towards French culture or anything else, but there's an intolerance towards Irish culture. Somehow it's seen as a threat. And when Catholicism and Irish nationality are mixed together, that's seen as a double threat. It was definitely interesting to hear what he had to say about how maybe Irish Catholics are discriminated against as opposed to Italians or Polish or any other Catholics that come in from any other countries into Glasgow. I found out that Glasgow have their own women's Gaelic football team and so I went one night to meet and chat to some of the girls that are involved in that. 
After getting little response from using the S word, I decided to try a different tact with the Glasgow Gales. I told them I was making a film about Irish culture in Glasgow. I talked to two Irish girls from the team to learn about their experiences since moving to Glasgow. One of the girls is a teacher and she spoke about the difficulty in changing the opinion of the children she works with. When the word sectarianism was mentioned, I was met with a very uneasy response in our interview. After that, the girls made it clear they weren't comfortable with what they had talked about on camera. To me, this is the most interesting yet frustrating thing about making a film on this topic. Sectarianism is a subject which people are scared to speak freely about, which impedes Glasgow's effort as a city to face up to the S-word and fully resolve the issues surrounding it. I wanted to get in touch with Angela Haggerty, a journalist who has been a victim of sectarian abuse. When you look back historically, the problem began when uh, Irish immigrants fleeing the famine came to Scotland, um, many of them Irish Catholic. Um, the hostility that Irish Catholics received in Glasgow went on for decades. There was discrimination in the workplace, there was discrimination in, in many, many ways, there was abuse. All of these elements took place. So I think that to describe it as a war between Catholics and Protestants doesn't fully explain the background and the context to it. Tell me a bit about your personal experience with sectarianism. As Rangers were going into administration, I became really interested in the story and through that I met Phil McGillivon and he was looking for a book editor at the time. He was going to bring out a book about the financial collapse of Rangers because he'd led much of the story on it. He became hated among Rangers fans, absolutely hated, and therefore anybody who was connected with Phil felt the, the consequences of that as well, and that included me. As a result of that, I was then featured in a podcast uh, by a man named David Limond. Uh, just shortly after the book came out, he had a show on a podcast show on a thing called Rangers Chat. Within that segment, it was just a tirade of abuse. And within that, he asked his followers, people listening to the podcast, to harass me on social media. So there had been blogs written about me, um, letting people know where I lived, uh, giving them a, a bit of background on me, even my family members, things like that. So it was really, it was quite a worrying time and it culminated in that podcast and I thought I just I had enough of it. I thought it had gone way too far and I felt that I was in fear. When I went to the police, I'd sent in all the evidence that I had um, and the police officers present admitted that they hadn't listened to the podcast. They'd only had a very brief look at some of the other stuff and that they'd decided on the basis of that that, that that probably would be nothing that you could do about it because as a journalist in Scotland or as a person in Scotland, these things just happen. It was only the involvement of the, me the media outside of Scotland and thought, no, this isn't right, this wouldn't be acceptable elsewhere, so why is it acceptable in Scotland? So with the involvement of Channel 4 News, then Police Scotland did act and then David Lemond was arrested and there was a two-day trial. He pleaded not guilty and he was later convicted of a, a racial and religious breach of the peace. Well, to me sectarianism is, is hate crime and obviously as the police service we have a responsibility to enforce legislation um, which um, outlaws hate crime. So um, if people report hate crime to us, we have a responsibility to investigate it and bring the perpetrators to justice. It could be anything from a vandalism to somebody shouting verbal abuse to somebody actually being physically attacked um, and, uh, and it's perceived by the victim or some other person that it has been uh, done because of the religion or, or perceived religion of that individual. My name is Maria Hughes. I am the secretary of Cardinal and Hearn in Scotland, which is Friends of Ireland. Uh, we are an organisation that works to promote a united Ireland. We work against sectarianism and racism. We do a lot of education stuff. We do get people that come in thinking that it's a us and them situation. They are quickly weeded out, either told that they need to be educated on it, and brought round to understanding that we're all about activism, community work, about making our own society, no matter if you're in Scotland or Ireland or anywhere, about making your own community a place that, to be proud of. When I went to Cardinahairn, I was surprised by some of the women that we had met there and their passion for Irish culture within Glasgow and how they continue that through their organisation. I was really surprised by their shop and some of the merchandise that they had sold and there was t-shirts that said Fenians and 
and all that kind of thing. And I was just really shocked that things like that even exist within Glasgow. Women have always been a main part of the Republican movement. There was hundreds of girls fought in the 1916 Easter Rising. 2014 is the 100th anniversary of the organisation Coming a Man, which is League of Women in Ireland. Um, so what all the girls are doing here is we have formed a month of activities centred around celebrating that anniversary. Anti-Irish racism is something that we march to highlight all the time. It's too long been called sectarianism, whereas we recognise that a lot of it's actually anti-Irish racism. I'm not denying that sectarianism exists, I know it's there, but a lot of it's anti-Irish racism and we'd like to make sure it gets recognised as that. For me personally, it didn't become an issue to you. I was more grown up, maybe round about 17, 18 mark. That's when it became more personal. I got a season ticket to go to the football every week. Um, after Sheldon Rangers matches, the people used to come out and wait on us getting off the bus. And sometimes they'd attack us. We'd be sitting in the pub after the match and they'd actually come into the pub, the Red Lion, and attack us within there. Shout abuse. It became violent then to me. I'll give you an example. I had a telephone call. Uh, to my answering machine and the guy called me a Fenian Irish terrorist bitch. I wanted him prosecuted for anti-Irish racism. He was charged and done with sectarianism. Well, when I prayed through the town, uh, me and I, the another lassie in my band was told or shouted at saying, we are going to get raped tonight. I've been called dirty Fenian bastards. They, sp like they spit at you and it's disgusting. Some, sometimes it can be quite scary, to be honest with you, it can sometimes, but other times you can feel proud of the fact you're highlighting this campaign, things that the wrongdoings that happened, and, but a lot of times it can be quite scary with the things that you're faced in the street. I've even been assaulted <laughs> to the stage I was assaulted in Liverpool. We are nailed to the lady. That day I was on an outside rank and I had a guy this close to me and as I turned round he had slabbers dripping off his chin from f fury. We've got a lot of instances where people in bands have had their bosses on to them because they found out they're part of this organisation. You know, I mean, we work to promote no discrimination of any kind. If you look at the fact that there is Spanish Catholics, there's Italian Catholics, there's Polish Catholics, you know, they don't face the same level of abuse as an Irish Catholic will. I think it's generations, years ago, it's caused the sectarianism, it's just going on. But to be honest, I have experienced a lot more from women. See a lot more disgusting things coming from women than I do men out in the street. Well, traditionally, um, and the, the statistics will, will tell you the same thing, that it is primarily a, a crime that is uh, perpetrated by males. Um, women are invariably the, the victims. That's not to say they're not the perpetrators, but the majority would be, um, you know, it's a male-dominated um, crime. So um, obviously the, the females are seen more or less as the victims in relation to it. We now have a number of diverse communities within Scotland and Glasgow in particular who have different religions and we need to recognise the fact that it's not just about Catholic and Protestant, it's about everybody having the ability to um, have their religion and not fear that they're going to be attacked in any way because they have that religion in the first place. I wanted to learn more about whether sectarianism exists in other faiths out with Christianity. So I spoke to Asfa, a Sunni Muslim living in Glasgow. Could you please introduce yourself to us? Uh, my name is Asfa Inaitullah. I'm 39 years old, divorcee with three children. I'm a Sunni Muslim born in Glasgow. Could you tell me a bit more about your fate? I have been brought up as a Sunni Muslim by my parents and uh, my children are as well brought up as Sunni Muslims as well. Do you think that the ongoing conflict abroad has an impact here in Glasgow? 
It does to a certain extent, but obviously more so for them living out there because they have to deal with it. But I think over here, it's just like everyone just gets on with their lives. It's not a case of, oh, you're a Shia. If I did even know somebody that is a Shia, I wouldn't hold it against them. Tell us a bit about the Sunni Shia divide and how that compares to Protestants and Catholic divide. I just know that after our Prophet ﷺ passed away, that the Shias looked upon somebody else as a leader. The divide between Catholics and Protestants just seems so much more than Shia and Sunnis. I don't know why. Maybe that's because, again, I'm living in Glasgow and it's always on the news. What role do women play in sectarianism? Do you think they are victims or do they contribute to it? I think women play a big role. Mom is with a child 24 hours. So whatever is going to get taught by the mother, but that will affect the child and that has a big, big part in what the child is going to grow up, what he or she is going to be like. I, I'm a firm believer in this. And in Islam, a woman's role is very highly ranked um, regarding the family, the whole structure and everything. You know, if there's that, if there's no hatred, there's no division against other people, you know, then the child won't have that. Um, could you tell me about your views on interfaith marriages? When I was growing up, when I got married, my generation, it was like, no. Uh, Pakistani Sunni married a Pakistani Sunni. That was it. Um, no, there wasn't any marriages between reverts or, you know, Scottish people who have become Muslim. and that, It was unheard of. It's a lot more common these days. But interfaith marriages, I think they work. They definitely work. Yeah. There's no denying sectarianism exists. It does. But I guess it's not as big of an issue as it is in the Middle East. I guess once you come here, you just get along with life. And you, I guess most people who just come here are like refugees and asylum seekers, people just seeking ref refuge and just trying to get along and, you know. And it's not a big issue, I guess, and you just, I don't know, you just become one community, I guess. I also spoke to Roshni, a Protestant who converted to Shia. I think women can be victims insofar as, um, you know, the very practical manifestation of sectarianism, whether it's through um, verbal abuse, whether it's through physical violence, um, that can be there. It can also play a part when it comes to women making choices about their lives and also if they find a marriage partner, for example, who belongs to a different school of thought, um, there can often be issues for women within the family um, if they go down that route that can force them to make choices about do I do what my family want me to do or do I pursue this particular path? So in that sense, yeah, I think women can be victimised, but I think women can equally be perpetrators. Um, if women are circulating rumours, talk, stereotypes, preconceived notions of a different school of thought or a different sect um, within the religion, then that's not helpful to them, to their families, but it also spreads um, it spreads the stereotype further and we have a saying universally within Islam that you know if, if you educate a woman, you educate the generation, which is a wonderful thing, but then if that women is spreading something that's not helpful to the next generation, then that essentially fuels the cycle of sectarianism that we're trying to break down. So, so women can definitely be both. Have you ever experienced sectarianism? I remember once taking food into work um, and offering it to my colleagues and being told, no, we can't eat that food because it's come from a Shia house and Shias read funny things over their food and it's not good for us to eat that food. It might have a some curse on it or something. I haven't had any experiences like that back here in the UK, but I definitely, when I chose to adopt the Shia school of thought, there were a lot of people who made very conscious decision to separate from me. Are you aware of any sectarian, of, of any sectarianism within the Sunni and Shia communities in Glasgow or in Scotland? It's not 
pronounced in the sense that people would, would shout about it or make a big noise about it. But there is an unspoken understanding that this group will attend this mosque and this group will attend this mosque. And there's arguably not um, enough cross communication between those Islamic centres um, in the way that we, we, could, we need there to be. Because the Catholic Protestant thing is so key to, to culture in the west of Scotland for, for all the wrong reasons, really. If I think about it that way, I see it as football teams and sectarian songs and offensive language and very clear community divisions. Within the Muslim community, I don't think it's as clear cut as that. Um, I think... Probably the, the idea of, of, of hidden shame is perhaps more pertinent within the Muslim community because on both sides we don't probably talk about it enough. We don't work together in the ways that we need to to break down some of the barriers that exist. I think the argument becomes very polarised in the Muslim community so it does become about what's happening far away from home what happened in history, for example, um, and how different people on different sides of the debate perceive their Islamic history to be. What that means in practical life every day is that there's a line that you don't cross and that you don't talk about. And that makes it much harder, I think, to define sectarianism in the Muslim community in a meaningful way because it's very much about negotiating different grey areas that exist between the black and white. But I remember Roshni saying that there was a couple of incidences and especially when she went to Pakistan, she said there was an incident that um, someone refusing eating a certain food because it came from a certain um, house or a certain group that wasn't the same as them. Little things like that, I guess, they kind of put a perspective into the whole issue of sectarianism. Tell me about the word sectarianism and what it means to you. Well, division. 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 So division. You either go to a Catholic school or a Protestant school. And it's like people don't come out and say, what religion are you? But they would ask you what school you went to so they would know. Just obviously generations, isn't it? The way obviously you're brought up with your families. That'll always be there. That'll always be. I was interested in speaking to mothers and their role and if they felt that it was their responsibility to teach their kids about sectarianism and at what age would be acceptable to speak to them about that subject or whether it was maybe just down to the schools to teach them about that. I'm on my way to meet Amanda, a woman who I used to work with. She was born in Northern Ireland and now lives in Scotland. Well, basically brought up in Northern Ireland, um, moved over to Scotland 12 years ago. A big part of moving over to Scotland was to get in the way from the religious and the sectarian divide and not wanting to bring my children up in that atmosphere. I was born in a wee town called Ballyclare. It's a predominantly Protestant town. So yeah, we grew up with um, going to the Twelfth Day Parades, singing all the, the Protestant sectarian songs. And that, that's just the atmosphere and what you were brought up in Northern Ireland. Really what your parents done, you tended to follow the same route and done that too being a, a, a Protestant marrying a Catholic, and especially where he was from, um, it just wouldn't have been sensible to do that back home. So that's why we basically arranged it, came to Stranar, got married and went back home again. We got a house then in Belfast, and this was at the height of the Troubles. So it was things like iron bars and behind your door to stop somebody from kicking your door in at night. My next door neighbour, when I lived in Belfast, her husband was an IRA man who had been shot dead now, I had a bomb put in my windowsill at night. They simply just got the wrong house. Lots of women, way back, and I'm going back a while, probably late 70s, 80s, um, they were the ones who held the arms for the paramilitaries. Um, they were the ones who transported explosives. Um, and a lot of the, the explosives and ammunition were transported in babies' prams. The most harrowing time living in Belfast was just after the Shankle bombing. Um, 
that was an absolutely horrible night to be living in Belfast. There was 13 people shot dead that night within a five mile radius of where I lived. And it got to the point where I felt as if I wasn't being protected by the police and by the army in the area. They, they see me as a Catholic because I lived in a Catholic area. Um, and I was starting to feel that something's not right here. You know, just because you're one religion and not the other, you should be entitled to the same protection. Um, to which I actually took the MOD the court and won my case. Um, and I was awarded a lump sum of money from them. But that lump sum of money um, was used to buy a house um, and that got me out of Belfast. Both my children were christened Catholics. That is as far as their religion goes, because I made the conscious decision, I don't want to bring them up one religion or the other, I just want to bring them up good people. They, they don't know the terminologies of orange this or fenian this, um, and to be quite honest, I'd be totally horrified if they were to come out and say it. Um, that was one of my reasons for, for wanting to go out of Northern Ireland. And I know some people might turn around and say, oh, I come to the west coast of Scotland. I've, I've always felt safe here. Um, I've never had to barricade myself in behind my door because I was scared of one religious faction of the other coming and kicking in because of any beliefs that I might have or because who I was married to or because what my children might be or because of what football team I supported. It was good seeing actually kids out. We had a big field out the front of the house. You had kids playing football out the front of the house. Some were wearing um, Rangers tops, some were wearing Celtic tops to see them actually playing football together, which you, you would never have seen. I would never have seen that back home. Um, it was just that feeling that it's a little bit safer. Sectarianism over here is nowhere near, in my experience, what I've ever felt. I wanted to speak to mother and toddler groups to find out if sectarianism played a part in their community. My son, who's at school, um, because I'm finding that like, football chant and things are coming home and not really appreciating some of the words that he's picking up from school, as, as they do. Um, at five years old, it's, it is a bit young, so just trying to kind of explain to him, you know, why we don't say these things. And But nothing, it's not anything massive, it's just it's playground stuff at the moment. But yeah, it'll be nipped in the bud as soon as... Um, it becomes apparent. I'm a Protestant. I was brought up in the Church of Scotland, although I'm no longer a member. Um, and I'm married to a Catholic. Um, my older child goes to a Roman Catholic school. But I'm certainly not aware of any issues, be, you know, of kind of trouble brewing between uh, local schools. Whether it does ha happen at a secondary school level, it certainly did in Glasgow. When I was a youngster, um, and you know the, the 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 two sort of rival schools would meet for a fight at, at home time every couple of weeks or so, and there would be trouble, and then you know then it would die back down again. There's kind of troublemakers in all sections of society, and I think I think there is a problem with with sectarianism in Ayrshire and probably in the three towns in particular. You know, the, the drunken fights that you see, at, you know, in any town at closing time, you know, there was an element of, you know, feeling this or orange, whatever that. You know, I've seen it in kind of catcalling and, a, you know, drunken street fights and stuff like that. So I've just been speaking to a bar lady, which was quite interesting. She saw firsthand, she saw fights outside her bar. Um, some other instances inside her bar have included a lady, quite an elderly lady, coming in with her granddaughter and stopping as soon as she got in and pointing to a man at the bar, telling her two-year-old granddaughter that's what a Fenian looks like. She's also told me that she had a regular customer coming in who was about 28 year old and she refused point blank to drink out a green straw. And in one particular day, she lifted up the straws and threw the straws at the bar person saying that she would never drink out a green straw. 
therefore they had to change the colour of their straws to clear. She also told me that the another young child who was in with their mother um, came in and the words that came out the the grandchild's mouth were fuck the Pope, um, which is quite ridiculous. I went to that call to speak with Ellen, a mother with a young family. I wanted to get her opinion on sectarian behaviour within her own community. The sectarianism in LATCO, in my opinion, is quite bad, not only in adults but also in kids. You've got kids running about calling people fiends, you've got kids bullying other kids. What's, what's the first thing they'll say? My mum or dad told me that. If it's calling people fiends or calling them huns or calling them this, calling them that, they always hear it from some member of the family and that's where it all spirals from. So I was interested in speaking to an educational psychologist because I feel that they know how young kids' minds work and in what age they're easily influenced and whether these sectarian traits can be reversed. As, I mean, as they grow, they learn from parents' behaviours, attitudes, um, opinions, and the language parents, parents use is obviously extremely important with, with young children. And kids will, will copy and imitate and model themselves on the behaviour that they see around about them. And certainly when they're young, um, the, the biggest influence will be from their, their main carer and their extended family, the people they're in contact with mostly. Well, we would always feel that, that views can, you know, firmly head, held views can be reversed and challenged, but it does get more difficult as um, views become more fixed as children get older and go into young adulthood. It's definitely harder to change views at that point than it is to change, you know, an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old and their views. I would say quite a lot of women will be victims to it because the biggest percent of your sectarianism come from men. Men and alcohol feuding. Your bands as well contain men. The ones round about, well, the one in call is men only. There's no women in it at all. Whereas you've got other places round about that have women. So again, not only does sectarianism come into that, but also I feel the, the sexist part of it comes into it. Ellen was quite confident talking about sectarianism and she comes from a predominantly Protestant area in the, called Lark Hall and she was telling me some stories about what's happened in the past. There was railings in our town that were painted red, white and blue, there was green traffic lights that were smashed and there was not a green door to be seen in sight. I found Ellen's comment about the contribution of marching bands to be very interesting. So I approached an Orange Lodge in Glasgow to find out more. Normally most people that are in the Orange Order would be Ranger supporters, but we don't have anything to do with Rangers, it's a separate entity. I was born into it. As I say, my, my grandfather was a founder member of one of the lodges in Whitehinge. My mum and her sisters and her brother were all in it. My dad was in it as well. And then when we were young, the three of us went in. And then as we got older and came time to come into the adults, we got the choice whether we wanted to keep going. Or it's not something that we were forced into, it was up to ourselves. But the three of us chose to stay. My three children were in it. My girls then, as they got older, uh, they did come into the adults, but they had their families, they decided that they wanted to come out and they, they stopped coming. I think some young people do join because they've joined through the family. Other ones have joined because they want to be in it and find out more about it. We do have quite a few young members in the Orange Order just now. Um, we've got a few that are coming up to time for going into the adults. At the moment, the men have the biggest influence because 
the women aren't allowed into the, the male meetings um, to be able to contradict them. Although, I will say this, the women are the backbone. <laughs> We're the ones that do the fundraising more so than the men. I think a lot of the districts wouldn't exist without their women. Well, the 12th of July is this special day because that's the day that was the Battle of the Boyne. Uh, I know that when I was at school, my history teacher drummed into us that the Battle of the Boyne wasn't the important thing. It was a treaty that was signed after it. So, uh, but to me, the Battle of the Boyne was the important thing. It's, uh, and that's one of the things, because King William won that that battle um, for the Protestant religion to keep the, to keep our religion to keep the religious rights sort of thing. I like the atmosphere when we go on the parades. I like the atmosphere that we, that we have there. It's, it is like a kind of party atmosphere and, and out celebrating. It's not only the bands as well, it's also your, your lodge members and things as well. They play a big part in it all too. They've got this belief that to do with this and <laughs> what gets me and which actually makes me laugh is they have this belief on this King Billy. But the one thing everybody forgets is King Billy, right up until then, was Catholic. In this day and age, celebrating a battle that happened in 1660, when was it? Nine or so? I can't even remember when it was. It was that long ago, William of Orange, you know. You know, it's a way back to that, William of Orange and James, who was a Catholic, was put off the throne. It goes back as far as that, so it's ridiculous. In this day, 21st century, people are still arguing about it. Um, don't get me wrong, I take the kids and watch the bands. I watch them, but it's their music I enjoy. I enjoy listening to them. I enjoy seeing people smiling while doing it and walking down the street. But then when you've got the idiots that follow, that cause a lot of the problems, that's what wastes it a lot of the time for people. You'll have them fueled up with alcohol, you'll have them following them, walking with them, throwing their flags about and things like that. Well, we've had eggs thrown at us before. I think they did on Saturday, some of them had eggs thrown at them. I mean, we've had people making the sign of the cross at us off a bus, you know, into the parade. Um, normally we just laugh it off rather than react to it. It's terrible that these things happen. It's bad that the on road gets the blame of it. When it's not their fault, they can't help who's walking on the, the street, who's following them and what they're doing. They're not responsible for other people. We can only just keep doing what, we're, what we are doing and go out and have our marches and Hopefully people will see that it's not us that's causing the, the trouble, that the trouble's coming from the pavement. We are having a, a peaceful march through the streets of Glasgow um, only because we want to keep our rights to be able to march through the streets and keep our Bible open and our religious liberties. It's a very emotive subject and, um, you know, it's a difficult subject and it's getting people to understand what a hate crime actually is, that it is an offence, that it's not just banter, it is an offence and it has an impact on individuals and communities, it has an impact on their lives um, and we have to get that point of cro across to people that it is a crime and that we want to know about it so that we can do something about it. If we don't know about it, we don't know what's happening within the communities and we can't police the communities without the help of the people that are in those communities. I think as a filmmaker I'm definitely more confident now in carrying out interviews and approaching maybe a sensitive matter for documentary. I think also getting a plan into action, you know, if you feel passionate about something from the outset then go for it and get those contributors that you want and that's definitely something that I've learned. It was that whole idea of working in a team that I really wanted to be involved in and learning from professionals how to make films and how to research. So I guess I've learned a lot. I've really enjoyed making this documentary. 
I've learned how to interview and at the very, very beginning I was quite nervous and even down to contacting people, what would be the right way of contacting them, how many times you could contact someone and just getting the confidence and building up that relationship with someone. So I feel very confident now that I can go and contact someone, build up the relationship and get a good interview. From my experience of this project, I think anti-Irish racism is something that Irish people that have maybe come over here or are from Irish descent experience through other cultures within Glasgow. And it's basically discrimination against their own heritage. My children, if I were to have children, then I could, if it was something that came up, you know, through, I don't know, school or something they heard, then I could maybe like teach them about it and tell them about it. I, it's all about education, isn't it? Just knowing what it is and then passing that knowledge on. Everyone that I've spoken to has heard of an incident or they know someone who's been involved or they know someone who's been a victim at all different levels. There's many levels of sectarianism, but it's still rife. Well, Scotland is capable of changing there are issues with the way that it is reported. There are problems with the way that the media tackles this. The media quite often, the sports pages of Scotland's media will stir these tensions up because it sells newspapers, it gets a good old firm game. But it doesn't help the problem. It creates, it makes those tensions even stronger. It makes those divides even bigger. And Scotland has to have a serious conversation with itself about whether it really does want sectarianism, bigotry, anti-Irish racism, whatever it is that they want to call it, they have to have a serious conversation about whether they do want to end it.